Hey everybody, welcome to Tutor Terrific. In this video, I'm gonna look again at the TI-83 Plus graphing calculator. We're gonna do a video all about the analyses you can do with the graphing features on this calculator. Now these are very, very, very close to the same features and the same buttons and commands that you would use for all the TI-84 calculators as well. So this video can serve as a tutorial for those same features on that set of calculators. So here I have the TI-83 Plus and we are gonna graph. Now, if I turn the calculator on and you do some calculations, it's not clear how to get to the graphing features on this calculator, but in order to start a graph, you need an equation to graph. So here's what you do. You press the Y equals button here. Now, as you can see, I have one plugged in. Now, what I can do with this in order to see the graph on a Cartesian coordinate plane is press graph, okay. And now if it hasn't graphed there before, it's going to actually show this little blinking light here and it's going to actually graph from left to right. But here's what that looks like. You can see the origin of your Cartesian coordinate plane, you can see the tick marks, and you can see the uh, axes, and you can see the graph itself. Now this is the default window for your graphs, okay? Now let me explain what I mean. If you press the window button here, you can see what the min and max values for the x direction and the y direction are. Here it's negative 10 and positive 10 for both min and maxes respectively, and the increase, so the tick mark values, are equal to 1, okay? Now if we go back to the graph, you could see that there are 10 tick marks in each of the four directions from the origin. Now, this screen is not a perfect square, so the, the, the actual aspect ratio is not 1 to 1. The x direct, the x axis is a little bit more stretched out than the y axis is. Okay, now let's say you wanted to adjust your window to, th to see things differently. Well, you can do that right from the window button. Let's say I just wanted to see the first quadrant, just positive x and y values. What you would do is you'd make your x min zero and your y min zero. You can do an overwrite feature like that and it'll overwrite the entire previous setting. And then you can press graph to see how your changes have affected your graph. Now you can see that we're just looking at the origin in the bottom left corner and the tick marks to the left, excuse me, to the right and upwards are all that are visible. So this is the positive quadrant of the graph. Now we can go back. If we want to reset our settings to be the original settings, we could press a button called zoom for a lot of different shortcuts to window editing. But one in particular that we like is zoom standard. We press six or enter when we're on it. And this resets everything back to the way it was in the standard window, negative 10 to 10 in both directions. Okay, what if we were graphing, instead of a nice function like so, we were, we were graphing a trig function, okay? The trig function, let's say, would be sine x. All right, I'm gonna erase everything else here with the delete button. We're going to do sine x. Okay, if I were to graph that right now, it would look okay, but it wouldn't necessarily take up a lot of the space on the window. What can you do to adjust that so that it looks a little nicer for you? And also I want you to notice that the tick marks do not really line up, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, with the tick marks we'd like to graph and we use when we manually graph the trick functions. We would like to see things like pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. Well, there's a zoom button feature just for that, and it's called zoom trig. So press the number 7. If you look here, it's zoomed out on the y-axis. I mean, it's zoomed in on the y-axis, and it's zoomed in on the x-axis, but it's reset the tick marks so that they're every pi over 2. Look at the window button to see these changes. X min is now negative 2 pi, basically. And x max is approximately 2 pi. And the, um, the increase in the tick marks for x is 1.57, which is about pi over 2. And you can see the y min and the y max were reset from negative 10 to 10 and are now negative 4 to 4. So this is what you want to use when you're graphing trig functions. Okay? Let's go back to y equals and let's graph a function that has some bad behavior in it. How about 1 over x plus 2, okay? Now let's graph this guy in the normal viewing window. So 
So let's set zoom six, and it'll go back to the normal window. Okay, what you could see here is a graph that has an asymptote. Now, a lot of these asymptotes do not show up very clearly in the TI-83. They've really improved that with the color edition of the TI-84 and all its different types. Um, but in the TI-83, there's a little bit of a glitch, and you can see that it's sort of skipped a pixel and gone over a little bit, gone around the, um, the tick mark where it should be at x equals negative 2. If we zoom in, we can actually see that asymptote better. So if we go to zoom and press 2 and press enter, it will right now zoom in on the origin. However, we can move the center of zoom around. And right now you can see I'm moving it to the left. And it's that little plus. It's going to center my zoom around there. And the zooming magnification is around times 2. So I'm going to put that right at the x equals negative 2 tick mark. You can see the resolution improves dramatically for your asymptote when you zoom in. And that's good, but I wish it was, we obviously wish it was really nice at the uh, start. Now, that's what asymptotes look like, and that's how you could zoom in. Now, let's say you wanted to zoom out. Zoom, uh, and then press 3. And again, you're going to center your zoom out. If you want to zoom back out around the origin, you just move this back over to the origin. Make sure you see the tick marks and press enter. It'll go back to the original. All right. Now, let's look at another type of graph that will allow us to calculate and analyze some things about a graph. I'm going to go back and I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to put in a nice graph. I'm going to put in 2x to the cube power minus 8x squared plus 3x, oops, a plus there, I'll overwrite that, put a plus there, plus 6. Let's see what this looks like. Okay, a nice graph that's going to allow us to analyze quite a bit of things. We can calculate so many things about these graphs, but first I want to show you the trace button. The trace button allows you to actually follow along your graph and see how the x and y values of certain points fluctuate as you move from right to left or from left to right. So what you're adjusting are the x values with the left and right button. You cannot go up or down on the graph with the up or down arrows. That does not work. And it's all based on x or y, x, x right or left values. So the trace feature allows you to see approximately the x and y values for certain points. Not every point, there are resolution uh, drawbacks to this feature, but it is nice to be able to just look around and see the values. But beyond that, we want to do a lot more type of analysis. And the way to do that is to press second trace. Second trace gives us this calculation menu. We can calculate all sorts of things. For example, first, let's calculate a value. What we're allowed to do with calculate value is we're allowed to plug in a certain x value. Let's say 2. If we plug in 2 into here, it'll calculate the y value for that x. And it'll show me where it is. Negative 4 specifically. You could press another one by just pressing the value um, that you want, and it'll reset that, and then you can find the new value, 71. Very, very useful. But let's say we wanted to calculate where certain things occur, such as zeros, or where the x-intercepts are. That's another term for that. Press second, trace, 2, or move down to 2, and press enter. Now we are calculating the x-intercepts. If you look at this graph, there are three of them. And so you have to tell the calculator which one you want to look at with the left and right bound feature. So right now, my cursor is moving around the graph left to right. Let's say I want to find, oops, excuse me, back to the graph, second, calculate, zero. Now, let's say I wanted to find this middle zero right here. Okay, I'm going to move like it says left bound, I'm going to move to the left side of that zero, making sure that I have no other zeros between the one I want and this cursor, okay? So this is on the left side of just that one zero, and I press enter. It puts an arrow up there, okay? And I'll explain what those arrows mean in a second. Now let's move to the right bound, which means we're going to move to the right of that one zero, making sure to not put any other zeros in between us and that cursor, okay? Press enter again. What these two arrows tell me is that it's going to calculate a zero between those two values. 
those two x values. And it says guess, it's not really guessing, it's really calculating it. You press enter a third time to make it find it. So, the zero, that particular zero occurs at x equals 1.401, etc. Now the y value we'd expect at that point it to be zero. Now the resolution limitations of this calculator sometimes give you these glitches. This is actually 1 times 10 to the negative 12 in the calculator's language. That little e is a shorthand for that times 10 to the exponent. And that is essentially 0. It's 1, one trillionth. So it's really uh, approximately 0. So that's how you calculate a 0. What if we wanted to calculate now some of these extreme relative or local extremas? We could do that. Second, calculate. We would uh, use buttons three and four. Let's do a minimum right now. Now we could see a local minimum or a relative minimum down here. So we put our uh, cursor on the left side of that, making sure there's no other extrema between us and uh, that uh, minimum. And then we go to the right side of the minimum, make sure there's no other extrema. Don't go too far. And now press enter a third time. It's going to calculate the minimum value in that region, in that interval. And uh, there's the x position of that minimum point, and there's the y value for that minimum point. So the relative minimum of this graph would be negative 5.259, approximately. Now let's do uh, find out what this maximum is. It's really the same procedure, but you just press the number 4 instead. So we go back here. We go to the left side of that maximum. We move until we're just on the right side of that maximum and press enter twice. And it calculates it for us. It happens at 0 0.2029 on the x-axis and the value is 6.296 approximately. Now there's one more thing I want to show you before we move on to multiple graphs. And that is the table feature of our graphing utilities. So if we press second graph, we get a table which shows us the values of x that uh, I previously plugged in for another problem to start with. Now let me show you how to set up the table so that it looks pretty much normal, like it used to be. We could set where, what x value we want the table to start at. We could show uh, or determine how much each value is separated by. In this case, it would be uh, the integer 1. And then down here, we can set the independent to either ask which allows us to pick values that we'd want to see the y values for, or auto, which will just start at zero and go up by ones. So if we press second table now, we could see that our x values are increasing by ones starting at zero, and we can't adjust what those x values are. And this can be annoying for some people who want to analyze a particular section of a graph numerically. What you would do in that case is you'd press second window, and then make the independent variable ask like that okay now what this does if you go back to second table is it won't populate it with anything because it's waiting for you to ask it so five four three eight point one for example so i'm plugging in the x values i want to see this is very useful for people who are calculating numerical limits for example, I want to get really close, a tenth, a hundredth, and a thousandth away on either side of a particular x value that might be undefined. So that's how we use the table feature. Now let's look at what you could do when you have multiple graphs. So I'm going to put in, on the y2, I'm going to put in another graph. And you can put in as many as you want. I'm going to put in a nice and easy 0.5x minus 1. Okay? So 1 half x minus 1, a linear function. Now when it goes back to the graph, I now have two graphs showing. The cool thing is that if you have graphs that are really similar in shape and you want to differentiate them, you can, if you go back to y equals, and you go over here, when you see the uh, type of line here, this slanted line, what this represents is how the graph shows up. You press enter, you have multiple options. You can have a thick line. You can have a shaded region. You can have a shaded region below. You can have dots with little uh, holes in them. And you can have just little dots. Or you can have little dots like this. Okay? So let's try this one. When this is selected, my first graph is now a collection of dots, which are evenly separated. 
instead of a line. Now this is for the purpose that I want to show you today very unuseful to us. So let's go back and switch it to something else. Let's switch it to, and this is a cycle so it goes through, let's switch it to a thicker line. Press graph. Okay. So if you had two similar uh, polynomial curves, you could differentiate which one is which with that feature. Now what we're going to do is we're going to actually calculate something with these two graphs. Now the, the thing that being it's very useful for us with two graphs would be number five, the intersect feature. The intersect feature allows us to figure out where these graphs intersect. Now if you have multiple curves, more than two I mean, you would need to choose which two you are dealing with. So for me, I only have two curves, so I would just press first curve and second curve. But I want to put my cursor on each near the intersection I want to calculate. There are three intersections for this particular set of graphs, and so I'll put my cursors near this leftmost one and press enter twice. It's going to calculate that intersection. And it happens at negative 7.37 and negative 1.36. So if you were to calculate this algebraically, that would be one of your three answers. Now, there's more answers because there's more intersections. So if we wanted to find another intersection, second calculate, uh, second trace 5, we're going to move my cursor, which is now on the first curve, close to my next intersection. And press Enter. It actually puts the cursor on the other line right next to it. And then you press enter twice, and it will calculate that intersection, which happens to be at 1.4 on the x-axis and negative 0.28 on the y-axis. Now, what would the table look like when I have more than one function? Well, if I press second table right now, I've got my previously asked for x values, but I have the y values from the first equation and the y values from the second equation. I can go ahead and, by the way, change any of these over right with a new value, or I can go down to the bottom of the list and add more. Like so, and I can add as many as I want and see the y values for both equations. All right, let's say instead of a graph, you have data, and you wanted to plot that data. Okay, first, let's get rid of all our graphs, and let's go ahead and first um, set our window to something that would be plottable, like statistics data. We'd get rid of the x and y negative values. So the y and x mins would both be zero. Then we go to stat and press one for edit. We have uh, our data from our previous table, actually, um, from a, a recent set. And what I'm doing now is I'm editing L3 so that there's no data in it. So I just have bivariate data one x value and one y value. And here is my data right now. I can actually plot that data by pressing second. So once we're in this stat plot menu, we would pick plot one. We're going to set plot one to plot the data we had in that stat edit window. And so I'm going to turn plot one on to start. And I'm going to make sure it's this original type, which would be data in a um, simple um, graphing window not any of these other box and whisker plots or histograms or other data like that. It's not the kind of data we have. We just want to make sure that the X list is L1 and the Y list is L2. Now they're default to something else, Lperg5 and Lperg6. So you want to set them to L1 and L2 by pressing second. And then you see for on top of number one, you see L1, that stands for list one. So you make sure it says that. And for Y, you'd set second two to make that list two. Now you have three different types of marks for your data points, and um, pluses, squares, or dots. So let's pick squares, so it shows up easier. Now we can quit this window, it's going to save our settings. We go back to y equals, and we see that plot one is now turned on. We can of course turn that off by going up to it and pressing enter, and pressing enter again turns it back on with all of our settings. And so now we can press graph. and it shows our data points. And we can graph this data with functions as well, and it won't mess them up. So if you have like a linear regression feature, and you're trying to graph your line with your regression, your linear regression, you can do that. This won't be a good one, of course, but you could show that uh, you can graph lines and data points all together. Okay, guys, this has been a short,
basic tutorial on how to use the graphing features of your graphing calculator. Stay tuned for more. Right now, this is Falconator signing out.